Good morning. I'd like to welcome you back to a new week and another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. And the passage we're dealing with this week is back in our Luke text. We're in Luke chapter 11. And uh, if you have been following our Luke series, this was a couple of weeks ago um, when we dealt with this passage of Scripture. So I hope that this passage will be an encouragement and that, that the Lord will use it in your life to help you to develop discernment. And that will be the focus of our week, um, helping us to think biblically about the contrast between real, vibrant, genuine Christianity, and man-made religion, which can come in lots and lots of different forms. And I would even say that um, even true biblical Christianity, at least in the doctrinal statement, um, can begin sometimes, if we're not careful, to take on a lot of the form of dead religion, um, like what Jesus is addressing. And let's remember that when Jesus is confronting Judaism, obviously the rabbis were studying the Old Testament, they were expounding the Old Testament, and even though they were handling God's word and they were involved in the sacrificial system and all those things, um, what they were doing as far as the form of their faith, what they were living by, um, it was not the, the, the real deal. It wasn't real genuine biblical faith in the Messiah who was coming, but rather it was a system that resembled truth and imitated truth, but was spiritually dead and was incapable of actually changing people and giving them eternal life through what Christ has established for us in the cross. And so I'd like us to look at this text together. We're not going to read the whole passage together this morning because it is a lengthy passage, but I want us to get into the, the context and just kind of set the tone for this confrontation between Christ and the religious leaders. So Luke chapter 11, and we'll begin reading in verse 37. It says, And he spake, a, and he, as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him, to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now, do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness? Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? Now, I'm going to stop there because we will eventually this week get all the way to verse 54. And that entire section is a narrative, and Luke is recording the details of Christ going and eating at this man's house, a certain Pharisee. But what I'd like to do today is give you a summary statement of this, of this text that we're dealing with, talk a little bit about the context, and then set up the confrontation that is going to be the focal point of this entire narrative passage. So first of all, the summary. Christ is aggressively confronting numerous flaws within the rabbinical practice to demonstrate the foundational flaw that shaped their religious system. Now, when we think about Judaism and the rabbinical practices, we need to think in terms of a tree. And the fruit that is produced on a tree is the result of the nature of that tree. And the nature of that tree and the health of that tree is connected down to what is in the root system. And so when we talk about the practices that Jesus is going to confront, he's not just confronting the practices. In other words, the fruit of what is there. He is confronting the root problem. He is confronting the nature of the tree itself. And so we have to think in those terms. It's about establishing discernment to be able to confront this system that is being um, contrasted with real faith in the Messiah. And so God ultimately wants our lives to be shaped by truth, and he wants the gospel to be the source of everything. He wants that to be the central message, and everything flows out of that. So in order to appreciate that concept, we have to start with context. And the context really for this confrontation starts in chapter 11, verses 14 to 26. To, to, to understand that first thing that Jesus talks about, there is a healing of a man who's demon-possessed. And when the rabbis and when the people in the crowd, when they witness what has taken place, this is the way that Luke describes the event. He says, the people wondered, and some of them said, he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. 
Now, this week, as we look at this text of Scripture, one of the things that will come out um, throughout the passage is that later on in the text, Jesus is going to mention blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, that is exactly what these people were doing. They were attributing the, the witness of the Spirit of Jesus's person and work, the witness through the Spirit casting out a devil, them saying, oh, that is done by the power of Satan. That blasphemy against the Spirit, that rejection of the witness of the person and work of Christ is ultimately what he's talking about in these verses when he talks about the blasphemy of the Spirit, how that's an unforgivable sin because if you don't accept God's witness of Christ, then, then how can you have faith in Christ? That really is the heart of that. And so that's the first of the things in the context. The second is that he rebukes the crowd because they're very complacent. In verses 27 through 32, he says, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. It's not just that people have access to the word. It's that when they hear the word, they internalize it and they obey it, they act upon it. They live in the light of scripture, not just hearers of the word, but doers, people who are not self-deceived. And he says, this is an evil generation because they seek a sign and there shall no sign be given them, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. Now that is a reference to ultimately the resurrection. And so he says, if they're not going to receive the witness of the spirit, and they're not going to embrace the witness of the resurrection being a sign that authenticates, demonstrates who Jesus is, then there's no other hope for these people. And then the third thing we find in the context is in verses 33 to 36. He warns them of the way that they interact with the truth. He warns them of the danger of having a heart of complacency and rebellion and ultimately not seeing the truth correctly. And so in verses 33 to 36, we see this follow, the following statement. He says, when thine eye is evil, then thy body shall also be full of darkness. Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. And so he is revealing that if a person wants to not lose access to the truth and doesn't want to become blinded and their heart becomes darkened, then they have to respond the right way to truth. And so this is all the context. This is leading up. This is building up to this confrontation that we have in the rest of these verses. The second thing I want us to do is I want to kind of set up this confrontation by noticing what is, what is written in verse 37. It says, as Jesus spoke, a certain Pharisee besought him that he would dine with him. And he went in and he sat down to meet. Now, at the, if, if all that was written was what we just read, then it would appear that this man is inviting Jesus because he wants to interact with him and ultimately have fellowship with him, commune with him. But that's not the case. And we see that because Luke makes a point in the narrative to emphasize that Jesus didn't do something that the Pharisees saw as very important. And when he didn't do it, the Pharisees had a very condescending attitude toward him. And this Pharisee was not the only person in the room. He had a lot of other people. In other words, he stacked the deck against Christ because he wanted a confrontation. And Christ brought the confrontation to a head by his actions and then his words that followed that. It says, when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. The narrative is making a point that when Jesus sits down, he immediately goes to eat and the Pharisee goes, what's going on? He did not first wash. Now, I'm not gonna get into this this morning, Lord willing, tomorrow, we're going to expand that a little bit by looking at that word washed and what he means by that because this is significant to the rest of the discussion, the rest of the things that Jesus will say. But that's for tomorrow. I want to draw your attention to a few simple thoughts that are illustrated here that we need to think about today and will set us up for the future. The first is this, God cares about what is true. And because God cares about what is true, he confronts areas where people are embracing lies. He confronts people's blind spots. He does this for the good of the people that are involved. And just like he did that with these people, 
He does it with us as well. He also does this to help people come to maturity. Um, on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about Christian love in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things that I mentioned is that this issue of patience is a virtue that is both demonstrated in difficulty and it is it is developed in, di in difficulty. And God's desire is for us to become matured people. That means he's going to confront us. That means he's going to bring circumstances to bear in our lives so that areas that we need to grow in, areas where we need to be confronted in, um, those areas will be drawn to the surface where we will see the need to respond humbly and to grow. Thirdly, he does this for the good of other people around us. If people are willing to get, or if they, if they make choices that ultimately lead to destructive ends, but they never experience the consequence of those things, then people around them are emboldened to walk after the same pattern. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes where it talks about a ruler that does not punish wickedness actually encourages people to go further down that path of wickedness. And so what God will do for the good of the people around us is sometimes he will allow the consequences of our actions to come to a head so that people will be warned. The last thing I want to mention here is that we should anticipate that these kinds of situations are going to happen. Every one of us has areas where we are blinded to seeing things correctly. Every single one of us has areas where we need to grow in our perspective. We need to develop maturity. Um, in our perspective. Every single one of us needs to develop in maturity in our character. And God needs to warn us constantly about the consequences of actions and the consequences of ways of thought. And so we should anticipate that these are the kinds of things that are going to happen. When they happen, we shouldn't be shocked. So those are the things I wanted to share with you this morning. Lord willing, this will give us some stuff to think about and also prepare us for the rest of our studies. Have a wonderful morning, and Lord willing, we'll meet again tomorrow. Bye now.